and welcome to New Employment Laws of 2022. I'm Angela de la Husse Ashley, and I'm the founder and managing attorney at DLHA Law Group. I will be introducing the speakers, and I'll be your moderator today. DLHA Law Group is a 21 year old law firm that specializes in business law with an emphasis on labor law. Thank you very much for sharing your lunchtime with us today. This will be a 45 minute presentation with a period of time for questions and answers at the end. We'll also take a brief pause at 1245 or thereabouts for people to log off if needed. If you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A box, not the chat box. And we will take questions in the order that they're submitted unless we're answering a question that's related and then we may answer them together. If we do not get to your question, or if you have a follow-up question after the webinar, please don't hesitate to email us. You can email us at info at dlhalaw.com. That's info at dlhalaw.com. Without taking more time, let me go ahead and introduce our speakers today. First is Lindsay Meyer. Lindsay is our senior employment attorney at the firm, and she will be discussing California's, or excuse me, she will be discussing updates with the COVID-19 vaccine mandates in the workplace. Next will be Lauren Okadis. Lauren is one of our associate attorneys at DLHA, and she'll be discussing California's Silence No More Act, record retention requirements, the expansion of CIFRA, and California's new wage theft bill. Last, you will hear from Kellen Stevens. Kellen is our senior transaction attorney at the firm and he will review California's ever, evol ever evolving independent contractor classification law, also known as AB5. He'll also be discussing developments in the hotly contested sphere of mandatory arbitration agreements. Without further ado, let me turn it over to our speakers and I will start with Ms. Meyer. Lindsay? Thank you, Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. It is absolutely my pleasure to be presenting to you all today. Thank you very much for joining us. I will go ahead and get right to it because we have a lot of information to cover. As Angela mentioned, I am going to begin by covering the Emergency Temporary Standard um, or the ETS abbreviated that was recently issued um, by OSHA related to the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Um, it has since been stayed by the courts and also suspended by OSHA itself. Now, even though the ETS has been suspended for the time being, it's likely in some form this mandate will go into effect most likely next year. Therefore, I will begin by going over what the initial OSHA ETS required prior to its suspension, and then discuss the ETS, um, its present status, and what it means for employers going forward. First, I will clarify just very quickly what an ETS is, what is its purpose? The Occupational Safety and Health Act permits the agency, which is OSHA, to issue an emergency temporary standard, ETS, that it can enforce immediately if it arrives at a conclusion that there is a grave danger to worker safety, um, if, if that exists. Now, obviously, that is what enabled OSHA to issue the most recent ETS regarding mandating COVID-19 vaccinations. Now, who uh, is covered under this ETS? So, uh, prior to its suspension, on November 5th of this year, OSHA published the ETS and it applies to private employers in all workplaces that are under OSHA's authority and jurisdiction that have 100 or more employees company-wide. It does not apply to federal contractors or those otherwise subject to centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. Now, as far as how do we calculate this count of 100 or more employees, part-time employees do count towards this total but independent contractors do not. This is always uh, a slightly sticky area in the law. It can be a bit confusing. My colleague, Kellen Stevens, will be presenting um, on this later as far as uh, what, how you define an independent contractor versus an actual employee. So again, it's very important that you are properly classifying so you can, um, you know, not only is it compliant with the law in California, but to ensure that you have your count right if the, this ETS do, does go into effect. 
Now, what does the mandate require? Under the ETS, employers with the actual count of 100 or more employees must require these employees to either be vaccinated or present a negative COVID-19 test weekly and also wear a face covering when indoors. It also requires employers to pay for employees' time spent getting vaccinated and also recovering from side effects. Now, prior to the suspension, um, by December 5th of this year, employers were supposed to comply with all of the requirements of the ETS, and it's rather extensive, um, other than the weekly testing requirement. So this would have included um, establishing a vaccination policy, determining employee vaccination status, providing the requisite time off, um, paid time off, and ensuring that unvaccinated employees are wearing masks when indoors. Um, also prior to the suspension, as of January 4th of 2022, all unvaccinated employees were to begin undergoing the weekly testing and submitting that to the employers who are covered by the ETS. Now, in issuing um, the ETS, OSHA has also sought for it to become a permanent OSHA standard. Under the OSHA Act, um, ETSs are to be in place for only six months, so just an FYI on that. Um, and prior uh, to the ETS even being issued in November, there were some states and private employers, as I'm sure you're all aware, that had already announced that they would be filing litigation regarding this ETS, which potentially would result in a stay or the ETS being invalidated. Well, of course, that did happen, and the ETS issued by OSHA is now currently stayed. Um, again, it went in effect on November 5th of this year, and then one day after on November 6th, the U.S. Courts of Appeals for the Fifth uh, Circuit temporarily stayed the enforcement of the ETS pending further action by the court. Thereafter, on November 12th, the court granted the motions uh, to stay that were filed by various petitioners. Those included companies, individuals, and state governments. Um, so the enforcement of the ETS has been stayed pending a final ruling on its legality. On November 16th, things just keep changing and updating, um, as I'm sure we're all accustomed to now relating to COVID. But on the 16th of November, OSHA itself announced that it was suspending all implementation and enforcement efforts related to this ETS regarding mandatory COVID-19 vaccination and testing in the workplace. However, uh, to be clear, OSHA does intend to resume implementation and enforcement of this ETS following the litigation if it is permitted to do so. Accordingly, for now, employers who, that were going to be subject to the ETS do have some breathing room, which is nice. Um, so they are no longer faced um, with the December 5th, 2021 and January 4th, 2022 compliance deadlines regarding implementing the vaccine mandate and the weekly testing program. Of course, as always, uh, we highly recommend employers remain vigilant and in communication with their legal counsel to ensure they're receiving all updates regarding this matter. Um, so you stay on top of it and you make sure that your company is in compliance uh, in particular, or if you are going to be a covered employer under the ETS. So now I will go ahead and turn to my next topic, um, also uh, regarding COVID-19 vaccine mandates, but this is regarding employers issuing uh, their own COVID-19 vac vaccination mandates in the workplace, and also the employer's obligation to engage employees in what's called the interactive process. So while presently the OSHA ETS has been suspended by OSHA itself and also regarding uh, also stayed by the courts, many employers are pushing forward with implementing their own company wide COVID-19 vaccine mandates to ensure the health and safety of their employees, their customers, their clients, and, and also because it's, it's imminent that likely some type uh, form of the ETS will be enforced at some point down the road. So even without the ETS in place, private companies and government agencies can absolutely require employees to get vaccinated to, uh, to COVID-19 as a condition of working at the company. In doing so, employers should first um, update their written company policies with a comprehensive addendum addressing the company's COVID-19 policies and procedures, including the vaccine requirement. 
Now, if the OSHA ETS is ultimately found enforceable, it will require um, such written COVID vaccine policy to be put into place by covered employers. So it is a very good idea for employers to be proactive now and uh, reach out to their legal counsel to begin preparing these policies if they have not already done so. Um, of course, individual employees absolutely retain the right to refuse to get COVID-19 vaccines, um, but those employees have no ironclad right to legal protection um, to retain their employment if they do so. Now, the exception, so pay attention to this part in particular, there is an exception to that. Um, employees who have a disability or a medical condition or a sincerely held religious belief may be excused from the vaccine requirement and entitled to a reasonable accommodation under the law as long as um, the employer by providing that accommodation to the employee and allowing them to be exempted from getting the vaccine does not present an undue hardship to the employer uh, and I'll, I'll get into that a little further in my presentation um, now, some employees, you know, as they may be entitled to request to be exempted from the vaccine mandate, um, employers should absolutely include very clear procedures with their COVID-19, um, within their COVID-19 company policy for employees to follow if they need to request a reasonable accommodation. Um, many employers um, have actually begun preparing reasonable accommodation request forms specifically related to um, their COVID-19 vaccine mandates um, so they can provide those to their employees and it really helps streamline the request process and um, the ability for the employer to, to work with the employee on that. We absolutely provide these services to our clients. So please contact us or your legal counsel if, you're require, if you require any type of assistance in preparing your COVID-19 company policies or accommodation request forms. Now, when handling uh, these requests for accommodations, of course, um, you know, once the employee either verbally or in writing makes this request, um, the employer has to go into action and, you know, receiving the request um, is not the end. The employer then must engage the employee in what's called the interactive process. So upon evaluating an employee's request for a reasonable accommodation, typically, um, you know, based on a medical condition or disability, the employer would engage the employee in this process. And for this webinar, I will focus my discussion on the interactive process as it relates to employees seeking to be exempted from the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Although this obligation absolutely arises for issues related to other medical conditions and disabilities in general. Uh, this can be somewhat of a complicated process depending on the situation. So again, I strongly recommend consulting with legal counsel when a situation arises when an employee is asking for an accommodation related to the COVID-19 vaccine or for any other reason. Um, now, in general, upon receiving a request um, for an accommodation, the employer should absolutely be very prompt in its response um, to any request for an accommodation and take great care in documenting the steps and interactions it's having with the employee to ensure the employer can show how it is taking steps to comply with its requirements under the law to engage this employee in the interactive process. So I'm using the term interactive process a lot. Uh, what does that mean? In California and under, under California law and under federal law, what it means is um, the employer and the employee are both inquire, required to engage or participate in a timely, good faith interactive process and determining what, if any, reasonable accommodations exist that would enable um, an employee to remain employed. And again, generally, this would apply to employee who's disabled or with a medical condition. But in this instance, um, employees can be exempted um, under the law from receiving the vaccine based on a sincerely held religious belief. So the interactive process is designed to analyze the purpose and essential functions of the employee's job at issue. And specifically regarding uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, the next step would be for the employer to consult with the employee to find out what job, job related limits, if any, besides just being exempted from the vaccine are created by the employee's disability or medical condition, or again, in this case, a sincerely held religious belief. Um, 
The process requires the employer and employee to work together to identify and assess potential accommodations that would enable the employee to perform their essential functions and duties of their position without requiring the employee to receive the vaccination. Um, it is also important uh, just to remember that the interactive process is not a one time interaction. Um, instead, the process is ongoing and it may require not always, but it may require, um, you know, a reassessment of a previously provided accommodation, especially if the initial accommodation is no longer working for the employer or the employee. So, to summarize. Under California law, legal liability can be imposed on an employer who fails to engage in a timely good faith interactive process. There is somewhat of a split of legal authority on this issue, but the trend generally is to impose liability on the employer for failing to engage in the interactive process when a reasonable accommodation existed that would have enabled the employee to continue to perform the essential functions of their job. So it is very important for employers to recognize the need to actively participate with an open mind in this process with the employee and you know, make best efforts to try to come up with a reasonable accommodation. Lastly, I would like to touch on reasonable accommodations that can be provided um, to employees who are seeking to be exempted from the COVID-19 vaccine. Now there's two common, uh, the two bases would either be medical condition disability or sincerely held religious belief, as I mentioned before. So um, employer employers who are implementing a COVID-19 vaccine mandate who receive a request for a reasonable accommodation based on a medical condition or disability can ask the employee for a doctor's note, um, you know, advising that that employee needs to be uh, exempted from the COVID-19 vaccine. Additionally, if needed, the employer can also request input or clarification from the employee's um, healthcare provider, placing the restrictions on the employee if the limitations are unclear in any way or to obtain input on whether a particular accommodation would violate the restrictions. Now, absolutely, the employee does not have to disclose their medical condition and that should not be asked, just simply their restrictions are what they are required to provide. Um, generally, if an employee can't receive a COVID-19 vaccine due to a disability or medical condition, the employer will likely be able to accommodate the employee by having the particular employee modify their working location, their job duties, or providing them additional protective gear to wear to ensure their safety and the safety of others in the workplace. Now, on a very quick side note, um, just separate from the COVID-19 vaccine, I do, since we're talking about accommodating um, individuals um, in the workplace, just recently in September, the EEOC recognizes that long COVID may now be a disability under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, um, Long COVID, some of you may be familiar, um, is a condition that individuals who have previously contracted COVID-19, who maybe are no longer testing positive for COVID-19, they're, but they're still dealing with um, the effects of it and having, uh, you know, have been physically impacted by it. So if an employee is having, um, suffering from long COVID, that should be treated just as any other medical condition or disability and the employer does need to work with that employee to see what type of reasonable accommodations they can provide to permit that employee to still remain employed and perform their job. Um, so that was just a quick side note. Now getting back to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine mandate or exemptions to the mandate. Um, also another reason would be um, that employers are receiving from employees are requesting to be accommodated and exempted from the COVID-19 vaccine mandate based on a sincerely held religious belief. So the employer does have a duty to accommodate absent a hardship um, when an employee has a sincerely held religious belief that conflicts with the employer's COVID-19 vaccine requirement. Um, the guidance explains that the definition of religion under the law is broad and protects non-traditional religious beliefs that may be familiar to employers. 
Um, that being said, um, what is not protected under the law are employees' social, political, or economic views or personal preferences. So, um, you know, in, in general, if an employee is just not wanting to receive the vaccine because they don't, they believe their own immune system, for example, is more apt to fight off the virus, that in itself, without being tied to a sincerely held religious belief, would not rise to the level of providing them that protection under the law to be exempted um, legally from a COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Um, now, a sincerely held religious belief, um, you know, it has to be sincerely held to qualify for the accommodation under lo the law, but also um, the law does recognize that the sincerity of an employee's stated re religious belief is not usually um, what will be found to be in dispute. And the employee's sincerity is generally a matter of the individual's credibility. So essentially the employer does have to kind of take the employee's word that this is their this is their really their belief based on their religion. Um, now there is guidance that provides factors that might undermine an employee's credibility, which would include whether an employee has acted in a manner inconsistent with their stated belief, um, whether the accommodation sought is a particularly desirable benefit, maybe something the employee requested before and, and was turned down for, um, as, and now is trying to get it in a different way, um, and also whether the timing of the request is suspect. So in general, um, the employer should take the employee's uh, sincerity, uh, you know, as it is, you know, take it on face value. But if there are things that come up that seem to be questionable, um, employers are allowed to objectively um, ask questions just to verify the sincerity of the individual employee's religious belief. Now, as far as documentation, um, employers can request documentation um, from the employee's religious leaders, for example, to verify um, their sincerely held religious belief, but it's not required that the employee provide that. So yes, you can ask for it. If the employee doesn't produce it, that does not mean you can turn down and deny the request for the accommodation if otherwise you know, they're meeting all the criteria. Um, now, as a general matter, employers are not required to provide an accommodation that would pose an undue hardship on the employer's business. And um, in the context of a religious accommodation, that's been interpreted to mean anything more than a de minimis cost. So these costs include actually both monetary and the burden on the conduct of the employer's business, including the risk of spreading COVID-19 to other employees um, or to the public. So again, um, there are many considerations to take into account when evaluating an undue hardship. Some of those would include, you know, whether the particular employee making the request works outdoors or indoors, whether or not the employee works in a group setting, whether the employee has close contact with others, especially those who might be particularly vulnerable, um, the type of work uh, place in general, um, how many individuals enter the workplace, and also the number of employees who are seeking a similar accommodation. So um, again, it, it's a it's a kind of a tricky analysis. And if you do believe uh, your would be a, your company would be um, suffering an undue hardship by providing accommodation, consult with your legal counsel to see if it's uh, there's a way for you to either accommodate the employee or to legally. Uh, decline providing the accommodation. Um, additionally, uh, just to clarify, uh, if there is more than one way to effectively accommodate an employee without creating an undue hardship, the employer is allowed to choose which accommodation they want to provide. So, for example, uh, many employees often it would be their preference if they if they have to work around others and they are legally allowed to be exempted from the vaccine, they may say, well, I'd like to telecommute, you know, that's I'd like to work from home. But if the employer feels that they can have the employee wear a mask or maybe work, relocate them to a different section of the office so they're not working 
in close proximity with others, the employer can absolutely um, offer that accommodation and they do not need to um, go with the accommodation that is preferred by the employee. Now, of course, the employer should and, and can consider the employee's preference, but the employer is not obligated to provide the preferred accommodation to the employee. So that's important to note. Um, now, examples of types of reasonable accommodations that would work for these employees who are allowed to be exempted from the vaccine, either based on their medical condition, disability, or sincerely held religious belief, um, that would include having um, the unvaccinated employee obviously wear a face mask, work at a social distance from coworkers or non-employees, perhaps work a modified shift, get periodic tests um, for COVID-19, uh, be given the opportunity to telework or possibly accept a reassignment or any combination of these. So again, there, there are many, many ways often that employers can find a way to accommodate an employee that work for both the employee and the employer. And I know I covered a lot of information there and there's probably a lot of questions. So please absolutely ask questions at the conclusion of our uh, presentation piece. And with that, I will go ahead and turn over to my colleague, Ms. Lauren Okadis. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and hello, everyone. I have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. So the first item I will be discussing is the Silenced No More Act. So this act was signed into law on October 7th of this year, and it will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. So just a little history behind this act is, is that it does expand on a current law called the Stand Act, the Stand Together Against Non-Disclosures. And so the Stand Act was in response to the Me Too movement, which revealed the considerable role that secret settlements were playing in sexual harassment and discrimination claims. So the Stand Act specifically bans non-disclosure agreements and non-disparagement provisions in cases of sexual discrimination and harassment. Now, the Silence No More Act expands on the Stand Act and prohibits non-disparagement provisions and NDAs and settlement agreements involving all forms of harassment or discrimination on any protected basis. So that includes unlawful acts based on race, religion, medical condition, and so on. So it's no longer solely based on just sex. So starting January 1st of 2022, any non-disparagement clauses or provisions cannot have the purpose or effect of denying the employee the right to disclose unlawful acts in the workplace, such as harassment or discrimination or any other conduct that the employee believes to be unlawful, regardless of the actual merits of the claim. So this actually also goes to show the effect it will have on any agreement that you put in front of an employee, such as a raise or bonus, where the employee is agreeing to the raise or bonus in exchange to agree to release all claims against the employer. So employers can no longer have an agreement like that if the employer is asking the employee to keep any and all alleged acts of discrimination or harassment a secret. So the act also makes a few other key changes as well. The first is that if an employer is offering a current or former employee a settlement agreement related to the employee's employment, the employer must notify the employee that they have the right to consult an attorney and they shall have a reasonable time period of no less than five business days to do so. So you can give them more than five days, but the minimum is five business days. Now, if an employee wants to waive this grace period, they can, and they can sign the agreement prior to the end of the reasonable time period, but only where the decision to do so is made knowingly and voluntarily and is not induced in any way by the employer through fraud or misrepresentation or duress. Uh, another question we've received is that, may I still continue to use non-disparagement provisions in my settlement agreements? And the answer is maybe, it just depends on the circumstances. But if employers want to use a non-disparagement provision as a condition of, of employment in a settlement agreement, the provision must include a statutory disclaimer. And the disclaimer is, Nothing in this agreement prevents you from discussing or disclosing information about unlawful acts in the workplace, such as harassment or discrimination or any other conduct 
that you have reason to believe is unlawful. So you would need to include that statutory disclaimer within that provision, within that particular agreement. And if you uh, need any assistance on finding that, please do reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide that to you. The other thing I'd like to point out is that the Silence No More Act actually does not apply in situations where there is a negotiated settlement agreement that resolves a claim that's been filed either in court or through an administrative agency, or just even through the employer's own internal complaint process, but only provided that with that agreement, the employee is given notice and an opportunity to retain an attorney. A few other things is that the settlement agreements can still include a general release or waiver of all claims, so long as the release or waiver is otherwise lawful and valid. Um, and the other thing is that an employer is still not prohibited. They can still contain provisions that protect the employer's trade secrets, proprietary information, or confidential information, so long as the provisions do not involve any unlawful acts in the workplace. And the other thing is that settlement agreements may still require that the amount paid for the consideration remain confidential. So that's still okay. So employers should update their employment agreements, settlement agreements, severance agreements, and the like to ensure compliance with this new law, as any provision after January 1st of 2022 that does not conform to this law will be held void as a matter of law, it will be considered against public policy, and it will be unenforceable. So if an employer and employee sign an agreement with a provision that doesn't conform to this new act, and the employer pays the employee consideration, the agreement will be held unenforceable. So it's really important that you reach out to your legal counsel or you can reach out to us for more information on how, become, how, how to become compliant with this new law. And moving on to my next slide, the employer record retention requirements. So the requirement now is that uh, it's two years. However, this new requirement expands it from two years to four years. And so the new requirement would oblige employers to hold on to relevant documents for four years with a certain exception for scenarios in which the employer has been notified that a complaint has been filed with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. So it's only in those scenarios where the employer would be required to retain all of the re relevant documents until the matter reaches its ultimate resolution. So what does this mean for employers? Well, employers should speak with their HR department. And if you are your own HR department, that's great, that's fine. Please be sure to update your company policies concerning your employees' personnel records so that you are compliant with this new law starting January 1st of 2022, which is in approximately 30 days. That's crazy. Um, okay, so moving on to my next slide, the expansion of CIFRA. So this year, CIFRA underwent major changes with more changes coming in 2021. And so CIFRA stands for the California Family Rights Act. And so CIFRA is legislation that authorizes eligible employees to take a total of 12 weeks of paid or unpaid job protected leave during a 12 month period under qualifying circumstances. So before, CIFRA only applied to those employers with 50 or more employees but since the amendment, CIFRA now applies to employers with five or more employees. So now CIFRA generally applies to most employers. So CIFRA permits employees to take leave for their own serious health conditions, but also as well as the serious health conditions of a spouse, a registered domestic partner, a parent, or a child. But again, in 2021, this year, there was another amendment that now adds grandparents, grandchildren, and siblings to that list. And most recently in September, uh, parents-in-laws have been added to that list. And so the last item I'd like to point out um, is that there was also an amendment that modified the procedural aspects of the Department of Fair Employment and Housing's mediation pilot program. This is new, it was established this year. Um, and so the California legislator established this mediation pilot program for CIFRA related claims for employers with five to 19 employees. And so basically what the amendment does is that it fishes, excuse me, it fixes issues related to the implementation of the program so that the mediation program occurs in a timely manner. And the other thing is that if either the employer or the employee requests the mediation, the employee cannot pursue a civil action against the employer until mediation is complete. 
Um, so what does this mean for employers? Please update your employee handbooks and your CFER related policies and procedures before the end of the year so that going into 2020, 2022, you are in compliance with this new law. And so moving on to my final slide, I will be discussing the new wage theft bill, which was signed into law by Governor Newsom on September 27, 2021. So this wage theft law adds a new type of grand theft charge for an employer's intentional theft of wages or tips for an amount greater than $950 for any one employee or in the aggregate $2,350 for two or more employees in a 12 month period and violations of this new law carry a potential jail sentence of up to three years. Now, with respect to the potential jail sentence, prosecutors now have the authority to decide whether to charge an employer with a misdemeanor, which is imprisonment in a county jail for up to one year, or a felony, which is imprisonment in a county jail for 16 months or two to three years, or they can issue a specified fine, or they can do both. They can do a fine and imprisonment. So. Um, it is uh, new and um, employers should, should carefully read this and please reach out to us if you have any questions. But furthermore, uh, this legislation also doesn't prohibit the employee or the labor commissioner from commencing a civil action to seek other remedies provided under the labor code. So what this legislation does is that it increases the penalty for employers who are charged with intentional theft of wages and it creates a separate penal section for prosecutors to use with respect to the specific charge. Now, I do wanna clarify that to fall under this uh, specific law, the, the employer's wage theft must be intentional. So it is still a little unclear on, on exactly how intentional wage theft will be defined or how strictly it will be interpreted. However, what we do know is that theft of wages is defined in the labor code as the intentional deprivation of wages by unlawful means with the knowledge that the wages or other compensation that is due to the employee under the law. So as the year goes on, we hope that courts will provide additional clarity to this bill and examples of what this would include and look like. So please be, for, be sure excuse me, to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, as we do regularly post about developments in the law. On the flip side, this also potentially means that it is unlikely that an employer's inadvertent mistake or honest mistake will be actionable. Now, I do want to provide you with some examples of what wage theft could look like, um, just to kind of picture it in your mind. So examples of wage theft could include paying less than the minimum wage, failure to pay overtime, failure to provide compliant meal and rest breaks, requiring employees to work off the clock, and failing to reimburse employees for business expenses. And there's many more. So if you have any questions regarding other examples of wage theft, please do reach out to your legal counsel or you can reach out to us with more information. Another very important clarification I'd like to point out is that this law now includes independent contractors as employees. Yes, independent contractors for the purposes of this law are considered employees and the hiring entity of an independent contractor as the employer. So this law is important for those employers who regularly work with or use staffing agencies. This legislation specifically targets managers and supervisors who are tasked with implementing policies related to compensation and meal and rest breaks. So employers and those who hire independent contractors please review your compensation and meal and rest break policies and practices to ensure that you comply with this California law. So just remember, employers must ensure proper payment of wages or face potential significant penalties and or possible jail time. So if you have any questions regarding any of the laws covered in my segment, please do not hesitate to reach out. And I will now turn this to Mr. Kellen Stevens. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, that ties directly into what I'm going to start talking about, which is independent contractors and employees. 
Um, the first thing I want to emphasize is that in California, everyone, a worker, is presumptively an employee unless the employer can demonstrate otherwise. What has been the change in the past year and a half is that now um, an employee is, is um, a worker will be considered an independent contract or, or, or employee unless they meet an ABC test. Uh, that's a test that came out. It was codified in, um, in, a, in a court case and, and uh, or it was was presented in a court case and then codified subsequently. Um, there's three criteria and you have to meet all of them if someone's going to be treated as an independent contractor. The first is they have to be free from your control and direction. You know, you can set objectives, projects, goals, but the way they complete it has to be separate. Uh, the second one is what usually uh, ties up a lot of the businesses that we see. Um, what they do has to be outside the usual course of your business. So, for example, if you're a web development firm and you hire a web developer, you're probably not going to satisfy that criteria and they would be considered an employee. Um, the last one is that, is this person customarily engaged in, in, in this independent trade or occupation, profession, uh, kind of, a, of the same nature of the services that they're performing for you? Um, and, you know, they look at whether that was in existence at the time. How do they prove that? You know, a lot of people, if they have an independent uh, business where they contract, they will be incorporated or have licenses or advertise, or they can just routinely provide their services. Um, so all employees, all workers have to meet those three tests or those three criteria of the test. And if they don't, they're going to be treated as an employee and thus subject to, to um, a lot more rules gov and regulations governing how employers treat them. Now, over the past year, there have been amendments to AB5, um, uh, quite a few of them. They're usually amended um, based on uh, creating uh, additional exceptions. Um, those generally will relate to specific occupations like certain professionals. Um, limited contracting relationships have also snuck in there. Uh, business to business relationships was one of the ones from the beginning. Um, as well like referral or staffing agencies. Um, even in that case, there's another test called the Borello test to figure out whether someone's an independent contractor. You know, usually if you have, you're working with these people, like with those exceptions, you're, you're probably going to satisfy that test. But, you know, if you are concerned about it, you, you, you would want to, you know, consult with someone uh, in order to determine like, is this actually an independent contractor? Uh, are, are there claims? Um, possible. So, um, you know, the, the important thing I think that Lauren had alluded to as well is that, and what I, what I spoke about earlier, is that the importance of classifying someone properly is that under California law, there are significant penalties. And I'm, you know, there aren't just like the, the wages and lost wages, but there's liquidated damages, and there's interest, there's state penalties and fines, um, you know, these can apply retroactively and the statute of limitations can be three and even up to four years. So just because you've terminated a relationship with someone that you thought was an independent contractor, they could come to you three or four years later and, and then uh, make a claim against you for, for wage theft or something as an employee. Um, so, you know, the net net is if you're hiring independent contractors regularly um, and even a single time consult an attorney before classifying them and really make sure that you have a written contract that, that'll help uh, you to define the relationship. Um, next, I would like to uh, um, address arbitration agreements. This has been a very interesting um, for lawyers, especially, but it also applies clearly to employers. Um, uh, some changes. So just a little background. Prior to January 1st of 2020, arbitration agreements were generally governed by this federal law called the Federal Arbitration Act, the FAA. Um, and it generally permitted them to be entered into, it gave the freedom of contract between people, there were certain restrictions. Um, however, California enacted AB 51. And that was set to take effect on January 1st, 2020. And it prohibited employers from requiring prospective employees to sign an arbitration agreement. So that was clearly an issue for a lot of employers um, that there were court cases filed and a district judge ordered an injunction against the law. 
um, holding that it violated the Federal Arbitration Act. So, you know, a federal law takes precedence over a state law. So that's why he enjoined it. Um, and it went on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. And recently, on September 15th, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld most of the law. They said, it's, we agree, and it's, uh, uh, it's legal for this law to ban mandatory arbitration agreements as a condition of employment, and it's legal to prohibit employers from retaliating against applicants who refuse to sign an arbitration agreement. Um, and there, there are civil and criminal penalties associated uh, for, for that retaliation. Um, however, the Ninth Circuit also said that if an arbitration agreement was actually executed, regardless of whether it was a condition of employment, the employer would not be liable under, under the, the law for any of the civil or criminal penalties. Um, this is very confusing. Um, it's kind of a contradiction. And on the one hand, you know, as an employer, you're subject to civil and criminal penalties if you have a mandatory arbitration agreement and the employee does not sign it uh, when it's presented to them as a condition of employment. But if they actually just end up signing it, then you're free and clear. That doesn't seem to kind of promote the public policy that I think the, the legis legislators were intending. Um, and also, generally, employers want the freedom to um, include mandatory arbitration agreements um, within their employment contracts um, in, in, in a way that was that gave them more power and was more broad under the Federal Arbitration Act. So right now, we're here where the Ninth Circuit made this ruling. Um, you know, they're generally banning them as a condition of employment. This is anticipated to have a rehearing and possible petition to the Supreme Court, which could kind of rule on this preemption um, uh, issue. But I think the, the important thing as an employer is you just have to kind of decide where your risk levels are and what you want to do. So I'm just going to lay out a few options uh, for, for employers if you have arbitration agreements. So the first one is you could just disregard AB 51, use your arbitration agreement in accordance with the Federal Arbitration Act, um, and, and that's it. And just then kind of go, go along that route. Um, the second one is you could carve out FIHA and labor code claims from your arbitration agreements. Um, those are the statutes covered by the, the by Section 432 of the Labor Code, which enacted AB 51. So you could do a little carve out, and that's kind of just like circumventing part of the law. Um, another thing that you could do, which I think for us is the best recommendation, um, because you know as lawyers we're a little risk averse is simply to draft a compliant document. And so that's gonna include kind of like an opt-in arbitration uh, clause um, because the labor code and AB 51, um, they only prohibit mandatory agreements uh, where you have to, or, or ones where you have to opt, opt out. So how do you do an opt-in document? You make sure that includes language uh, that makes it clear that, you know, entering into the agreement is voluntary and not a condition of employment, like specifically state that nor is it a condition of any employment benefit because this could you know, uh, be an extension of an employment contract and that might include additional benefits or a promotion or something. Um, you also wanna specifically state that the person signing it there is voluntary and there will be no retaliation if the employee chooses not to sign the agreement because that was also the big concern was that employers were by retaliating against them, not providing them jobs. And so you can say, hey, if I choose not to sign this, um, especially if they're already employed and it's an extension or a promotion and they choose not to sign it, that they won't be retaliated within the workplace where they're already employed. Um, and then the last thing um, that's also good, this is kind of like form-based, but if you make the arbitration agreement a standalone document, so it's not part of the employment agreement, that also just kind of, you know, uh, it gives the impression like this is separate, this is not required, here's your employment contract, this is all voluntary. Um, and so that's kind of what we would recommend if you want to have arbitration, which is generally a good business practice, is draft a simply use a compliant document. Um, you know, if you don't use them or you're just concerned about it overall, because we don't know what could happen in the future, even though we're getting closer to like the final result. Um, you could just suspend use of them until this whole issue is resolved. 
So um, that will conclude my discussion of arbitration agreements and workers. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their time. And I'm going to hand it back to Angela, who I believe is going to start um, providing us questions uh, submitted through the Q&A. Yes, thank you, Kellen. Um, let's see, Kellen, I believe the first question was going to go to you. And unfortunately, I don't have a copy of that. Do you have a copy of that there? Yeah, I think I saw it. Um, here it is, the Q&A. Um, so are the agreements before 2020 affected? Oh, yeah. So the question is, are arbitration agreements entered into before January 1st, 2020 um, affected by this law? Um, yes and no. Primarily, no. If you have an employment contract or ar mandatory arbitration agreement with an employee entered into before January 1st, 2020, the law is not retroactive to those. That those are done. And also, you know, kind of based on the Ninth Circuit ruling, they're already executed. So none of the penalties or anything would apply anyway. Um, however, this does apply to agreements that are modified, amended, revised, or extended. Um, those are all kind of the same words, but if that happens to an agreement um, after January 1st, 2020, then this law applies to those. So you have to make sure that, again, if someone's being promoted or, or you're extending the term or moving them, the status of them as an employee, it's really critical that if that happens, um, that you make sure that there's a compliant document that you say, you know, the, the arbitration's voluntary, you know, there'd be no retaliation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's the most important part. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, the next question is related. What about arbitration agreements entered into after January, 2020? Are they invalid, even if no penalties apply to the employer? So are they, they're, no, they're not, they're not, invalid. It's just that if um, if an agreement is entered into after that, that, well, look, if it's executed, then it, there's actually no issue. Um, it's the, So they're not really, they don't become invalid. It's just that if you present it as a condition of employment and the person doesn't sign it, then there are civil and criminal penalties if that person elects to pursue those claims against you. Um, that's why it's kind of confusing. Like it should be, you can or can't do this and there are or not penalties, but it's, it's the, the way the Ninth Circuit, I think the Ninth Circuit was basically trying to figure out a way to preserve the legislative intent while trying to make sure that it was compliant or didn't preempt federal law. I mean, that, that would be my guess on like why they ruled that way. Okay. Um, you know, I did mention that we would allow people to log off at uh, 1245 or at 1252. So anyone that needs to log off can. We'll take one or two more questions. And then any other questions you have, um, you can certainly submit to us at info at DLHALaw.com. Uh, the next one is, again, about arbitration agreements. Uh, so signed arbitration agreements before this ruling can be enforced against the employee. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Any signed arbitration agreement per this ruling can can be enforced against the employee. I mean, that that was the, the weird the weird kind of part of the ruling. Uh, but certainly anything signed prior to the effective date definitely will, will apply and you're, and you're fine. Just make sure that if you have any modifications to that, if you need to and, you know, sign it, you know, maybe it's mod modifying an employment agreement that includes mandatory arbitration. And then they sign that, you know, you have to make sure that at that point, if they elect not to, then then you subject yourself to civil or criminal penalties. You, I mean, you subject yourself. They won't necessarily happen. If the employee then signs the new one, you're fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, at this point, we are going to conclude our webinar. We thank you very much for joining us. We have a series of these uh, webinars and we submit them periodically um, through our e-blast but you can always email us to find out the next topic. We try to address timely issues, new laws, new regulations, and a whole host of different business-related um, industry areas. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for allowing us to present during your lunchtime. Please do uh, keep track of the different webinars that we, that we propose and have a wonderful holiday season.
Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.